Hey, everybody, welcome to What the Tech. I'm Andrew Zarin. Of course, I'm joined by Paul Therod. How you doing, Paul? Pretty good. How is are that you? better? This is the second take. Is yeah. that better? Yeah, okay. that worked better. Uh, I, I called you my handsome co-host, and I asked if Leo was ever referred to you as his handsome co-host. I, I don't believe so. See? You would have remembered if you did. Leo, is this going to turn into like a Me Too moment? <laughs> it is. Uh, we do have a lot to talk about. This is our annual prediction show where Paul and I discuss uh, certain things that we kind of expect or want to happen or think is going to flop, things like that in 2019. Um, it, people really enjoy these predictions. They like us speculating uh, on stuff. Mm -hmm. I know we don't really like to do that throughout the year, uh, but this is fun to kind of look into 2019 and then see you know, what, what we kind of get right and what we get wrong uh, throughout the year, which is interesting every year when we do this. Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of change came this year um i I'm, I'm a big fan of the direction that laptops have gone this year uh, mm -hmm. it, it was a lot of progression with you know the the i7s and the, the true quad cores and the macbooks now the macbook pros especially have really become uh a really uh, competitor even for editing on a laptop with the six core processors they're putting in there so there's been a lot of progress for like the geeky stuff but the mainstream yep. i was thinking what was the biggest advancement for them and it had to be the home automation stuff and it has to be the the home assistants right the smart assistants hmm. i would assume that that would be the big thing because i do a um i do elfster it's like a secret santa thing every year with my family mm -hmm. everybody i mean i'm not even exaggerating not one person did not have a google home or an alexa a, some oh. sort of alexa device uh everybody right. had smart lights on their thing so i think that would have been the big consumer level change in 2018. I, I would assume so. Yeah. I, um, did you ever go and did we ever look at the predictions we made last year? I can find it right now. Yeah. I uh, wonder, I, it would surprise me if one of the things we talked about wasn't the maturation of the personal digital assistant of the digital personal assistant market. Um, and I think, you know, this is actually one of the things that's on my list for next year. I think that this market heats up again, that the kind of mainstream acceptance of the technology combined with advanced capabilities, which are basically just IFTTT type things and yeah. scripting as, you know, whatever, the ability to have compound commands makes these things more conversational. It makes them more interesting and useful to people. And it just uh, helps that technology proliferate. So I found the best stuff. I found the worst stuff. <clears throat> New wave of personal. Did we not do a prediction show last year? That would break my heart if we didn't. Hmm. Maybe well, we did like not. I said, maybe that I would be surprised if we didn't discuss this. But I think this. I, I think that's going to be another big thing for next year. Yeah, I a hundred percent. And and th that <clears throat> it's IFT. What is it? IFFT. I, I think this, it's then that. T T T. Yeah. If this, then that. Um, yeah. I was using that years ago. I mean, I think you did too, right? I, I would, I would always yeah, use like but... a Facebook post to go somewhere else. Or if I posted uh, something <clears throat> on my website and I wanted it on another site, I would just do it that way. But now it's really, uh, this is the wave of it, right? This is exactly what yeah. it was meant to do, which is amazing. Yeah. I mean, so you can see how these things improve. You know, you could say, Hey, gee, do this thing. Or what is the answer to this question? Or what's the weather or whatever it is. And th that's a single command. But then they get smarter by uh, allowing you to say additional things after one after the other. And it understands that it's part of the same conversation. So you don't have to keep saying the, the you know, the code word or whatever. Um, but now they have these advanced capabilities, which aren't always literally IFTTT, but are sort of like that, where you can basically write what is a script and say, look, in these circumstances, or if I say this phrase, do these things all at once, you know. So um, I found, I found um, some notes that I had from mm -hmm. around the same time where we were predicting for 2018 and one of our biggest predictions was the impact of windows 10 on arm yeah for the okay. year let's talk about that <laughs> yeah let's talk about that but that, i mean that's a good one right windows 10 on arm what yeah the impact has been zero right and i assume the question i assume that was a question you know what will the impact be um that said uh, don't take that wrong i i Qualcomm is in this game for real. 
Um, they've got multiple generations of chipsets that they're working on. They have a plan uh, that will address, well, I should say multiple plans to address the couple of big issues that they have. And they did take a, a kind of a baby step, but a step toward addressing the one of the two huge issues the platform has this year, which is performance, right? So the initial 835 based uh, Snapdragon PCs were, were horribly slow, like really slow, like impossibly, uh, like too slow to use. And uh, with the second gen chipset, the 850, it's still slow, right? But we have lots of low end PCs. I mean, I think people will trade off some performance for the battery life uh, type of thing and the thin and light fanless perform, you know, not performance, but fan and light uh, uh, aspects of the system. But the big change is going to come next year, right? So unfortunately, it won't be till pretty late la next year, but sometime in the third quarter of next year, we're going to see the first PCs based on their third generation architecture. And this is the one that uh, promises a 2x performance improvement. And that's where it when becomes the, compa uh, when competitive. When were the 850s released? Do you remember? So uh, the first one was announced in August and it was just released in November. So there's actually only one PC on the market right now on that with that chipset. And there's a second one coming from Samsung. Sometime. Interesting. Yeah, I, um, I I mean, just thinking about it quickly, I was very surprised at the fact that we there was no aggressiveness with this. But I, was that, obviously it was because of the architecture that was slow and, and, and all that. But do you think it was also win, win, the Windows side not being prepared for this? On a, on a larger yeah, scale? Well, right. Um, yeah. So there's another, the other big problem actually is what factors into this. So aside from performance, which there's nothing you can do about, um, there's also compatibility problems, right? And, and there's two layers to this. Um, they've taken another baby step. You can make 64-bit ARM apps if you want to. I don't think many developers have bothered, but the big issue is 64-bit Intel style apps uh, that either run natively on the system or run through the store. Photoshop Elements is like the example I always use. It's 64-bit. It was obviously written for Intel processors or the Intel chips, you know, the Intel um, type processors. It will never be able to work on Windows 10 and ARM. And so how do you solve a problem like that when you have popular apps that simply will not run on the on the platform? Yeah. And you were, in this case, Qualcomm has to work with these companies to help them get it ported over and convince them to even do the work to port it over. And so, again, you know, in the baby step category, the one thing that they did was announce, uh, and they just did this, you know, two weeks ago, that they are working with uh, Google on Chromium and with Mozilla on Firefox so that those browsers will be made in native ARM64 form and mm. will be delivered through the web. So if you're on one of those systems and you go to firefox.com, you'll get the, in the future, it's not available yet, but you'll be able to get a native version of that browser. That's important because... Web browser for most people is the most uh, commonly used application. The web browser choices today on Windows 10 ARM aren't that great because all of the popular browsers run under emulation and they're really slow. And uh, that will that will be big. It won't solve my Photoshop problem, you know. But hopefully, they're going to get an answer, you know, a good answer from Adobe at some point as well. Um, to kind of so play we're on in the that, same places we were last year, in other words. <laughs> Since we were talking about Windows, uh, I do want to make a prediction this year. I do yeah. see there being an. Uh, this is again all speculation, right? I predict yeah. that we will get a better understanding of the relationship between Android and Windows, and I think there will be some sort of tie in there between Microsoft, Android, and some sort of. Uh, I, yeah. I'm still banking on the fact that Microsoft will release a phone. With their own launcher, with their own look, Android based. Oh, I see. Yeah, um, and they'll start off in emerging markets. They won't release it here. I'm curious why they haven't done that. To be honest, I, I think there's some cool hardware innovation that Microsoft could do. They they seem to have a nice handle on design. I think a Surface branded and Surface looking handset would be of great interest to a lot of people. You know and what? What would they, prevent someone? Like and and someone, you know. A, a lot of times, again, perception and the marketplace, the prevent people didn't buy a Windows phone because number one, they mm -hmm. didn't really understand it. Number two, uh, it was it was market saturation. Android existed, iOS existed, and it was very difficult. Oh, it's to, an app gap too, right? They didn't yeah. have the apps. But if you have the apps and you brand right. it as if it's you know, great yep. example. You said uh, with Chromium being implemented in Edge or whatever they call it, it may not have all the crap that you know, Google does and all the tracking stuff. I mean, that's a, 
that's an angle they could take with a phone. They they could do some something like that. Actually, I'm surprised they haven't gotten this request slash demand from their biggest customer base, the enterprise, right? That Microsoft could have these phones that are designed out of the box with all of the management controls, all the Microsoft software, all the integration with the Microsoft services that these companies want, you know? And I, I didn't have that on my list, but that's not a bad prediction for 2019 that Microsoft will finally come out with a surface branded phone of some kind running Android that has all of their stuff on it. I, yeah. You know, it, it's common sense. It, it seems, yeah, it seems like it's common sense and they do toy around it. Listen, they have office. Uh, they, they have it on Android already. They have all their applications yeah. on there. They have a launcher. That's They nice. don't have to sell a lot of these things, right? Yeah. I mean, Android hardware at this point is kind of a commodity type of thing. Um, they have years of experience now writing the stuff. They, there's deep integration that Microsoft does on Android because it's possible, which is not possible on iOS. And they have software to cover every part of the stack if you want it, you know, from the digital assistant to the home screen to the lock screen to the keyboard, productivity apps, the web browser. I mean, it, you could have a whole Microsoft thing going on there. Um, yeah. it's a, it could be a Microsoft phone. Also, we're not, we're, we're, I didn't even think about it when I mentioned it at first, but, uh, Xbox integration, gaming integration, uh, it's, you're, you're, you're describing all of the things that were the way they sold windows phone, right? Yeah. I mean, they don't have a music service anymore, but a mobile movies and TV app, right? So your purchased my, and rented Microsoft content would appear on the phone. Uh, the Xbox stuff, like you said, they do have. Uh, actually a couple of Xbox type apps now. Um, all the, obviously the office stuff, the new office uh, related kind of productivity stuff. Um, it's, there's a ton of stuff. Uh, it, it's the edge browser, you know, obviously. And of course the integration bits that you get just by using Windows 10, the timeline integration, um, all of the most recently used uh, document integration you get when you use like, you know, do you write documents in Microsoft Word or Excel or PowerPoint and they're available on every device automatically because you're saving them to OneDrive, you know, Microsoft Outlook for email and calendar and, uh, and well, email and calendar, let's say on mobile, uh, Microsoft to do for tasks. I mean, you get, there's a whole, it's all there. You, it's just waiting for someone to cobble it together. Yeah. You know, and people yeah. obviously can do that themselves today. Well, MG Geek in our chat says, for those of us who primarily use Windows and Android, it's more seamless. It's a more seamless ecosystem and the two would be a great fit. Yeah, it would, it would but it's a matter of, there being a demand of people doing it. What prediction do you have? Because I have a really good one for the next one that I think I'll get right. <laughs> so uh, that's not the right document. Um, let's see. Do you want to stick to Microsoft or do you want to jump around a little bit? No, wherever you want to go. It's up to you. Um, all right. Let me, let me, let me, let me stick with the Xbox thing. Um, there, uh, oh, the Microsoft thing, I should say, and I'll morph it into Xbox. Um, Microsoft has a thing, a service called Microsoft 365 for businesses, and there are different tiers of it. It's basically a superset of Office 365. So in addition to the Office applications and services, you get access to Microsoft's uh, mobile uh, device management technologies and also to Windows 10 Enterprise. There are rumors that Microsoft's going to make a Microsoft, a Microsoft 365 for consumers, and there's been some discussion about what that could mean and you know what, what things would be part of it. Um, based on the conversation we had yesterday on Windows Weekly with Chris Capicella, I'm going to guess that there is not an Xbox component to that, that when you look at Microsoft on the consumer side for Microsoft 365, what they're going to focus on is the productivity stuff. And that could mean whatever, but it's not going to mean Xbox. But I got an interesting email from Microsoft today. Um, they temporarily uh, provided a service called Xbox All Access. It was mm -hmm. basically a combination of all of their Xbox services, like the subscription services. And they're going to halt the sale of that at the end of the year. But they say that they're going to come back next year with something else and they're going to make it available in more places. And my prediction based on that very strong hint <laughs> is that this thing is going to be called Xbox 365 and that mm. uh, it will be basically the gaming version of Microsoft 365, obviously also for consumers. And it will combine Xbox Live Gold xbox game pass into a single thing and possibly other perks you know whatever they might be and it will be basically a way for you to subscribe 
to a service monthly, yearly, whatever, and get access to all that Xbox has. And I think that over time, this thing is going to expand. Right now, there's a there's a couple of Xbox uh, Game Pass games that uh, work on the PC, if I'm not mistaken, because I know the Microsoft uh, first uh, um, the Microsoft Studio games do, and they're often cross compatible. Um, I think there's going to be a bigger push to make it compatible on the PC as well. That's interesting. Um, that's actually a really good prediction. So, do you think it's a, it's horribly specific? And that, that and so in, in that sense, it's probably a terrible prediction <laughs> because when it doesn't happen, I'm going to look like a jerk. But I, uh, I, I think they see the I think they see the benefit of this Microsoft, and I think Microsoft users who are used to things like Office 365 and what a huge benefit that is over just paying for Office for one PC. I got a. Uh, um... We're also coming around to this stuff. I have a pretty uh, interesting prediction from one of our viewers right now. Uh, Treehouse Vince says, uh, he has a crazy prediction. Since Apple calls themselves a products and services company with hardware sales slowing down and RCS expanding slowly, iMessage will be available on Android in 2019. So there is something behind that because they were testing that out a couple, was I think like two years ago, they actually yep. had uh, beta software that they were using internally on Android devices and they were testing mm -hmm. iMessage on Android. Um, yeah. So I don't know if the timing is better now or it was then because, you know, obviously we're seeing a, a little bit of a slowdown in hardware sales, uh, which it happens. It goes ups and down, uh, up mm -hmm. and down uh, all the time. So is this the right time to kind of integrate iMessage? And what benefit do you have? Does, well, how does yeah. it benefit Apple to integrate iMessage in Android? So I'm going to tie this into one of the, the it was actually my number one topic uh, for the predictions, which is a broader issue that Apple has right now. Um, and I, I, if, if you listen, if anyone listens to First Ring Daily, I actually threw this topic out in a broad sense to Brad because I was curious what he thought about it. But I have noticed uh, that something's going on with Apple, right? And it, it's beyond iPhones aren't selling as well as expected. It's much more than that. And one of the things that's happened this past couple of I don't know months not even six weeks whatever is that all of a sudden Apple did this deal with amazon.com and they're selling everything they make except for HomePod directly through Amazon um, they also struck a deal with Costco and so you can buy like the new MacBook Air and some of their other new products through Costco so Apple making their products more broadly available isn't necessarily this earth-shattering thing except for one important point those products are always on sale at those places always on sale I mentioned to you a couple of weeks ago, remember, I, I felt dumb that I never bought the new iPad over um, Black Friday weekend because it was, I think it was a uh, um, $100, $100 off. Yeah. Right? $329 or $330 and whatever the price was. The regular, that was the regular later. iPad. It was the regular one, right? Yeah, the 9.7 inch regular yeah. iPad. So since then, uh, I have bought it because guess what? It's on Amazon for sale. And if you, you could look at it right now, like because the last time I checked, it was actually even cheaper. It was $110 off. Oh, so Apple is a company that has never, ever had a sale, like ever, not once. It does promotions, right? It does like a Black Friday promotion. It does a back to school promotion. But those, those promotions do not include things like $300 off a MacBook Air, $100 off an iPad. They're buy a MacBook Air and get a free, back in the day, it used to be an iPod or something, get a free set of uh, earphones or something or whatever, yeah. Air, whatever they're called. So that's how they do promotions. They don't do sales. Everything Apple makes is on sale right now or has been on sale in the re recently. Is this, a like, 20, this is has it, never happened. Okay, so I'm on so, Amazon right now. Is this a 2017 model or 2018? Yeah, uh, 2018. 2018, okay. 2017, it's, by the way, it, it, $302. Yeah, so this is, all right, here's the deal. The difference between that one and the new one is a slightly newer processor, obviously, and Apple Pencil support, which I would never need. Like, I could have gotten away with that one. Um, the Except I paid less than that, actually. I, or I paid only a little bit. I paid 329 I think it was, for a 128 gigabyte uh, iPad. Okay, so 9.7, this is the latest one. It's $349. Mm -hmm. List price right, is so 429 it says list, but this is the 128 gig one. Right. That's the one I bought. So yeah. when I bought it, it was $10 cheaper. At one wow. point, it was $10 cheaper still. It's there. It's going up and down, whatever. The point is, if you go to apple.com, 
That thing costs four hundred and twenty nine dollars. Mm hmm. Apple does not offer you $100 off an iPad ever, ever, except they are doing it right now. That is sold by Apple. It comes brand new in the box. It's, you yeah. know, it's, it's not a refurb. It's, you know, so my point so, behind all this is I, some Apple, something's collapsing and it's collapsing within the context of Apple, right? This is still a ginormous company. It sells millions of these things. It's not going out of business. I don't mean anything like that, but I think, they finally hit a brick wall this year with their 20% price hike with a user base that is tired of the constant upgrade cycle and is getting by just fine on the device they already have. And they're trying to figure out ways because remember, they're not reporting unit sales anymore, <laughs> but that what they want to do is pump up the revenues and the profits so that they can at least meet what they did a year ago. And I think this is part of it. And I think, this is going to lead to changes next year. They're going to have to change things. Well, what does this mean for their retail business uh, internally? You know, the Apple stores. If Amazon has it for $100 well, cheaper and Costco has it at $100 cheaper, what is the benefit of going to the Apple store other than the Apple experience? You brought up something interesting. Before you used to buy something, you used to get earbuds or you used to get this or you used to get that. Yeah, yeah. They're going to have to do that if, I mean, consumers well, are not so, idiots for the most part. Well, right. No, but I, uh, the Apple store, see, as long as you're running the Apple store in a way that it's not, costing you money right i mean it, it being in it being there doesn't cost apple money like they make money you know they each retail site makes more per square foot than blah blah whatever it is so they make money the the value proposition in the apple store is excellent it's a local place you can go to get service on an existing device that you have so it keeps customers happy that's important it factors into their consumer report scores because those consumers go to that publication so they had a great experience with apple five stars whatever um, it's still a kind of a virtuous cycle. If you, I don't think that Apple cares really whether you buy an iPad from them or from Costco or from Amazon or wherever, as long as you buy an iPad, you know, um, it is, but the, but the thing that's going to have to change, like I said, is, well, one of the things I think that these sales are, have basically been open secrets, right? No one announced the sale. Mm -hmm. No one, there's no Apple press release that says, Guess what, everybody? iPads are 100 bucks off at Amazon. Go you run over there and get them now. Like, no one announced these. I think these were like little, let's see how this goes, you know, because these are gigantic retailers. They've got a lot of reach, obviously, with customers um, digitally in Amazon's case or physically with Costco's case. Um, and they have their own kind of um, uh, loyal customer bases, right? There are people who just shop at Amazon. There are people who make a point to go to Costco. Like, we, we do this. Yeah. We go to Costco every week. Um, this is a way to get this thing in front of more people and be like, whoa, that's, well, that's cheaper than I thought it was. Or, you know, uh, you can see it's a sale price. You can see, I'm sure it's very clear. It's a sale. So, uh, I think this is a, I, you know, I don't, how does this impact retail? I, their retail? I, I don't think they care. I mean, honestly, I think the retail is not going away. It's going to continue to flourish, but the important thing is keeping those numbers up and they're scrambling. Right? Um, and they're never going to admit to this, you know? And the thing is, like, when they announce their earnings next month, they're going to have another blockbuster quarter. There's of course. no doubt about it. Fourth quarter sales. How you could know? it not be? How could it not be? Yeah. It's going to um, be incredible. I'm shocked right now at something outside of what you were talking about. I had mm -hmm. no idea the new Apple TV 4K is $179 and $199. Okay. It's $200. <laughs> Did you know this? I I don't, I don't, I bought it when it first came out. I don't, I, I, I have one too. What are you I, talking about? <laughs> what do you mean? No, I'm what did shocked you think at how it, I'm shocked. I thought it was 129. I'm shocked at how expensive it is. Oh, come on, Andrew. This is a company that sells a home pod that by itself is more expensive than two Sonos speakers. Mm. I mean, yeah. <laughs> like, are you yeah. kidding me? <laughs> well, but this, um, but, but again, like, but I think uh, this could be changing. Like, uh, I, like I said, uh, HomePod is an exception, although I think I did see a sale on HomePod, but um, at basically, I mean, there, there are going to be exceptions in the product line, but you, you can buy almost anything or could recently buy anything that Apple sells almost on sale. And my point only is that this has never, ever happened, ever. I, this has never happened. Yeah. And I think this... The, the prediction is, I think this is going to impact what they do next year. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. Um, the only, I mean, obviously, the only discount that they offer is that educational discount. Yeah. And I think, I, I, I'm 
I think it's a hundred dollars, but it doesn't matter. Nobody, most of their sales are not that. But you're right; they, they don't do sales. They they barely do it. And I, I would be more willing to buy it on Amazon because guess what? It's here, one day shipping, next mm-hmm. day. I don't have to go to an exactly. Apple store. I don't have to order from Apple.com. Um, do you know if they're they're releasing day of on Amazon? Uh, you mean when there's a new product? Yeah. So, no, I don't, but. You know, they just did this Amazon thing. So we I don't think we've had a chance to see what that looks like, right? So Because yeah. that'd be know. interesting if they do it, you know, yeah. two weeks after or a month after the fact where... I think it's an... Uh, by the way, you know, those events are big for Apple, right? They love being able to come back and say, oh, we just had the biggest opening weekend for iPhone, which you'll notice they didn't say this year. Um, adding Amazon and adding Costco... I'm just using these two examples because I noticed them. There, maybe there are others. You know, I, it doesn't. I, it doesn't really matter. But, um, like I said, this is a way to get these things in front of more and more people. Mm-hmm. And they already actually they already sold iPhones at Costco, obviously. Um, but it's these other uh, these other products, and they're on sale. That was the big thing. Like you just don't. You know, we got a we got an ad about this from Costco. Like, that hey, we're selling have. these things now, and it, you know, the MacBook Air was two hundred bucks off or three hundred bucks off, whatever the price was. You know, that doesn't, yeah, that doesn't Mm -hmm. happen. Uh, I have a, I have a very specific prediction, Paul. Mm -hmm. Uh, Hold on. I'm going to do like the Carson thing. I'm going to put it like, like I need the head, (laughs) the head thing. And I got to do this. I predict Microsoft is going to release two webcams this year. (laughs) Uh, 4k webcams. One, uh, one is going to be for, uh, telepresence and enterprise. And the other one is going to be for live streaming. This is just, I, I'm just, I see it. I see it happening. I don't know. I'm just, I'm gazing mm-hmm. into the future and I see this being released sometime in 2019. How do you feel about an uh, Xbox compatible Microsoft webcam? Yeah. So the gaming one would also be compatible with Xbox. It would have integration mm-hmm. where you could do the live stream straight from there. You could just stream, you know, the cameras on you. You're playing a game. You could do split screen. You could do all of that. That's what I see. Well, let's just say I have sources who can confirm that prediction. Oh, <laughs> so, okay. Um, so I got yeah, um, and <laughs> oh, but, but sorry, just real quick um, yeah, yeah. for people who have never experienced this because they don't really make this anymore. One of the neat things about having Connect on the Xbox One was that someone could walk up and they would automatically be logged into the system, and then they could start playing whatever game. And I, if I understand this webcam uh, thing, uh, I would assume it would do the same thing, right? Okay, so here's a question for you. Uh, I actually mm-hmm. wanted to ask you this. Um, because I, I responded to the email that I got about this and mm-hmm. they couldn't, they didn't know. Um, one of the ideas was hello integration, Windows hello integration. Yeah, where, hello, yeah. So when you walk up to your Xbox, it'll recognize mm-hmm. you and it'll log you into your account. And let's right. say, you That's know, exactly my, what it does. my son walks up to the Xbox and he yep. logs and he goes and he'll log into it. That that's what they were talking because that makes the most sense. It literally works exactly like that. In fact, okay. I've experienced exactly what you described with my son. You know, he yeah, he would walk up behind me, see what I was doing, and it would be like, "Bloop, Mark is online." Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is uh this is interesting because a it's a better bet than Connect, right? They and it'll market well, to more than just Xbox. Yeah. So there's two things going on here. Uh, Microsoft inexplicably has never made a Windows Hello compatible webcam that you could just attach to any computer. It's crazy, right? I've never understood that. It's crazy. Um, their own devices obviously have this capability and other PC makers make it as well. But it'd be, you know, I'd love to have one of them on my computer here. And I have a desktop computer that doesn't have a Windows Hello compatible. The um, last, um, I think the last webcam that Microsoft made was the LifeCam Life Cam. S- yeah. Cinema or Studio. I can't, one of them is the newer one. But it, I mean, you're talking... Years yeah, and years ago. ago. Years and years ago. Um, yeah, so I think that, that that's cool. Uh, it's necessary. It would be important for businesses as well as individuals. And then if it could be also be Xbox One compatible, amazing. And it, th- there you've got that thing that achieves the other half of the Connect experience that's useful beyond the special things that Connect did, right? So we have voice control, which you can do now through, uh, we have a normal headphone jack on the controllers. That's easy. But what we're missing is that you know, the other piece, the visual part of it. And you could do that through a webcam. It's not going to do like the, you know, you're not going to be able to jump up and down and do the X, you know, the connect. Yeah. That's not the point, but it's, it's the, you know, the, the auto sensing of the person. What was the death of connect? I don't, uh, nobody developed any games for it. It was just that not was, a okay. lot of buy-in. Microsoft okay. tried to force the issue. Remember they, 
they only made a version of Xbox One with that Connect, so you had to get it. You couldn't not get it. And then that first year was a disaster for them, and they had to back off. Interesting. Um, guys, uh, we love doing the show. Uh, this is, I believe, this is our last show of 2018. It was a crazy year. Uh, I my I had a major shift in my job. I, I I'm now consulting, but I'm not there. I'm more available here. I'm doing everything from home, and I'm putting in a hundred percent effort in GFQ. And I do appreciate everybody that I mean. I've gotten so many positive messages from people over the last couple of weeks, uh, last month since I left my job, and people are funding our Patreon, and they they want us to do more. We will do more. Uh, with your help, if you go to patreon.com slash what the tech, you can fund us there as little as $1 per episode. And, uh, we're, we're going to start throwing out some bonus material. Paul and I will do a, uh, weekly call in show. If, if we hit our goals, there's a lot that we want to do. And there's a lot that we could do together. And, and um, we want to continue doing this. So patreon.com slash what the tech. Also, look at this man. Look at Paul Therat here. His hair's growing back. He's ready for 2019. Uh, go to therat.com, sign up for Therat Premium. I'm a Therat Premium member. I've been a member since the launch, and you get a lot of insight. You get a lot of bonus stuff on Therat Premium. You do a show with Paul, uh, with Brad, obviously, uh, which I got to call Brad. I, I haven't spoken to him in a while. Uh, I do a show with Brad. You have premium content on there where you have uh, premium articles. Uh, one right now is, uh, what was it, the Sandbox? Sandbox could be the key for the future of Windows. It's, it's, a, it's a premium article on there. Great stuff. Go to Therat dot com and sign up for the rock premium i believe it's uh your first subscribe now your first year is 48 bucks that's it you got amazing content uh from great people um paul do you have a prediction yes. here i have a few by the way i feel like that <laughs> webcam conversation is going to get mm -hmm. uh picked up <laughs> yeah yeah um Let's see what haven't we talked about here we talked about digital assistant um i i think it's a certainty this is kind of video game or not kind of is literally video game related um i think we're going to hear about next generation playstation and xbox hardware next year right um sony kind of did a half step toward 4k with the playstation pro microsoft took a bigger step with the xbox one x but both of them still have a ways to go for true, what I would call uh, true 4K, meaning 4K all the time, every game, 60 frames a second. And I, I think that's got to be the, the target they're shooting for, whether they can get there with the next-gen systems, whatever they may be called. I think Sony will probably go with PlayStation 5, Xbox, you know, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, hopefully not Xbox One X1 or whatever, but, yeah. you know. Um, I think that's got to be the goal, right? So whether they achieve it, I don't know. Sony has already said, by the way, they're not going to appear at uh, E3, right? So that tells me that they're planning a big event of their own, which makes sense. A lot of companies are kind of learning that when they have to share the spotlight, they don't get all the press they want. So Sony doing their own event for PlayStation 5, tons of sense. I bet we see that in 2019. Interesting. Um, I wonder what the what, what do you think some of the, the extras are going to be other than, you know, you, you mentioned the 4K integration right now in the current platform. But what, what do you see? What do you yeah. see the next major uh, moves going? Honestly, I think that's the that's the, the, the crux of it. You know, like Microsoft, uh, aside from the Kinect, one of the big mistakes they made with the Xbox one, the first version was they really focused on entertainment experiences over gaming. And uh, they they made some bad decisions around getting rid of in-house gaming studios and not attracting enough developers with unique or console first exclusive type games. And it really haunted them this, um, this generation. They, Microsoft has never won a console generation, but it, it almost beat the PlayStation three with the Xbox 360. This time they're getting wiped off the face of the earth. And so they've, made a lot of really good steps to win back the gaming community xbox game pass is part of it and the services stuff but also um they've started buying up game studios so they can always ensure they have first party content uh that will be exclusive or at least console first and what they need is just you know more horsepower so i i i don't think we're going to see any connect style thing I, microsoft has said they're not going to do vr or ar on the xbox i think that's the right decision mm-hmm 
Um, I don't see that as anything more than kind of a niche sideshow to the main event. So, yeah, I'm curious to see because that actually kind of uh, dropped a little bit, right? AR and VR this year. The more it got popular, the more it kind of dropped. It's yeah. I always just saw this as a little blip, you know. I I think there are some interesting AR applications. Don't get me wrong, but as a as a kind of um, computing wave, it's it's just not. It's not like we've invented the new kind of laptop, you yeah, know, or yeah, whatever. Yeah. It's just, it's yeah, it's neat when it shows up. Pokemon Go is fun. Um, there's a couple of cool educational things, but it's just, it, you know, it's just a capability. It's not really like a big thing. Um, uh, let, let's also bring up the uh, Nintendo Switch. Uh, yeah. Do they? I, I think they're going to announce something this year as well, some right. sort of uh, expansion or or revision. Uh, by the way, this mm-hmm. is interesting. Uh, Nintendo Switch is the most popular and successful game console of this era, judged by the new sales figures released in the U.S. According to NPD Group, which is recognized as an independent (laughs) authority on this matter, the Switch has sold 8.7 million units since going on sale March 2017 up until the end of November. This makes it the most successful... uh, This makes it more successful than the Xbox One and the Sony PS4, when it comes to sales within the first 21 month of, of availability. Yeah, I don't know. Interesting. <laughs> so, um, well, I know, I know why it's successful. I, I mean, it, it, it's, yeah. it's successful because it's, it's a really nice piece of hardware. It's portable, right. and it's inexpensive. Uh, yeah. I, actually, I mean, I can't speak to the first X number of months of availability, but the switch has actually been outsold by the PlayStation four this year. So, okay. (laughs) But, um, and I think that the problem, you know, when you look at something like a PlayStation or an Xbox one and Microsoft and Sony, both are very aggressive about cost reducing the consoles and then adding incremental updates in the form of new console versions, you have this trajectory where the thing can accelerate over time and it becomes a little more future proof. Um, The problem for the switch is that, because it has kind of a cartoonish last generation graphics, it makes it good for the stuff, you know, like the portable gaming and all that and battery life, but it's not necessarily as future proof. So the question is, and Nintendo to my knowledge or my memory has never done this is whether they come out, whether they do what the other console makers do, which is, is there a Nintendo switch Two yeah. that is, you know, better than 1080p quality or whatever that is. Um, you know, uh, somehow offers to bump up the graphics, uh, which w- I think would open it up to a bigger audience. Um, and I don't know anything about that. Like, I don't know. I don't believe they've ever done that. I think Nintendo has always done things differently. I think their quirkiness is part of their appeal to their core audience. And I think the big success with this console, frankly, is that they got back a lot of people who had drifted away because the Wii U or whatever wasn't particularly compelling. The Wii U was a nightmare, and I got I got sucked into that. <laughs> yeah, I, I really did. And and they had a couple. And you know what was great? Their um their franchise games were good, mm-hmm. and everything else was terrible. Yeah, I I mean that was that was the reality of it. But it was the beginning of the Switch. The Wii U is just the Switch, you know, uh, done yeah. crappy first gen. I, yeah, I think um you know the 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 original Wii, and then I would say the Switch as well have both benefited from being like right product, right time. And they, uh, because a lot of their audience um, dates back to the 1980s, frankly, a lot of these people are, you know, they grew up on it as kids. Now they're young adults or now they have their own kids maybe. And they have, and this, here's a safe, fun thing that everyone in the family can enjoy, you know? So it's, it's a good strategy, but I, I kind of think they need to, I don't know, maybe future proof it a bit more. So something interesting that I've discovered last week uh, that mm-hmm. I know a lot of our, and this isn't a prediction, obviously, but I did want to bring it up today. Um, very, this is the first time I've seen this happen, but very quietly, Sega released their Sega Classics collection for the, yeah. for the, for the Fire TV. Oh, for the Fire TV. For the Fire TV. That's so funny. it's $14.99. And yeah. you have uh, Sonic, Sonic 2, Sonic CD, all the Streets sure. of Rage, Golden Axe, all the Golden Axes, obviously, uh, Altered Beast. I mean, it's their top hits for mm-hmm. 14 bucks. Let's see. Uh, <laughs> no, no they don't. 
They don't things, have that. The things would spin toward you or whatever. Uh, but this is this opens up something interesting for the for the Fire TV because they were really concentrating on gaming at one point, and it never took off because you really didn't yeah. get these titles and you didn't get uh, Sega of America or Nintendo, for example, or any of these companies mm-hmm. that really invested in doing something like this. This is uh this is a very interesting change for Sega. I'm sorry for the Fire TV. Uh, I yeah. have a I have the Fire controller. I have to download this and try it out. But <laughs> yeah, that's right because they make an Xbox type controller yeah. for Fire TV. Yeah, yeah. And but here's the funny thing. Okay, their rating is two and a half stars on this on this on this right. game. And the reason why is that people clicked buy and they bought it by mistake. Oh, stop it! Yeah, <laughs> those kind of. I didn't order this. I never ordered this. So you I could didn't you. Order this. Um, I haven't used the Fire TV in a while, but I assume you can hold the normal remote sideways and use it like a sort of gamepad kind yes, of Yes, and that sucks. So we right. could so do I bet that. a lot of people are playing these games and like, this is terrible on this remote, but what you really need is a controller. But they do have, a, you know, Amazon released the controller for the Fire TV when it first came out. Well, the second uh, gen came yeah. out. Yeah, no, I know. Right. I know, but and a lot of people probably don't have it. So Most don't, yeah. But yeah. now they discontinued it. It's on sale for 14 bucks. Oh, jeez. So it's not bad, you know? You could get... The- um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I feel like uh, video games haven't taken off an appreciable way on, like, Roku or Apple TV or, I guess, Amazon Fire TV. But um, it seems like I don't see any reason why they couldn't, you know? And I yeah. actually, maybe more to the point, like the Sega thing, there's a big market right now for nostalgia across the board. But in video games specifically... Again, you know, it's those people who grew up on Nintendo or whatever, or Sega Genesis back in the day, or in my case, like an Atari 2600 because I'm a dinosaur. But um, you see a lot of those Atari game collections. The Intellivision people have gotten back together. They're coming mm-hmm. out with a new console. Uh, a company called Atari is making a new console that looks like the 2600, actually. Um, you know, uh, Nintendo obviously has these nostalgia uh, consoles. Sony is doing those as well. There's a PlayStation Classic that's out now. Um, I, I think the sky's the limit for this stuff, yep. you know, and for people like us who grew up on something, like I'll just invent something, you know, like you think like Atari Lynx or what was that thing called? The Atari, was it Atari Panther? No, what was the, the Jaguar? Jaguar. The Jaguar. Um, you know, it would, aside from licensing issues, I guess you could emulate that thing on like a Raspberry Pi today, mm-hmm. right? So you could create an emulator, like an official one throw every single game ever made for the system on it, sell it for 50 bucks. And it would probably be a huge success and would be delightful for people who played on this thing back in the day. On every Sunday, my daughter comes to me and says, Daddy, I want to play video games. By that, she means watching me play. So mm-hmm. I have my Raspberry Pi and I bought, I, I bought the Raspberry Pi, I built it and I installed, you know, like these arcade beat em up. Like this is, it's this arcade collection I have on there. So it's essentially... Every type of arcade game that was ever on the arcades on there. So I was playing it, and you know, I I forgot how much fun it is to just beat, just to do like a beat 'em up. I don't really have to yeah. think. There's really not too much strategy. <laughs> just don't get hit, right. and you play it, and they're quick. In 30 minutes, you can beat the game. Sure. And I've I've started doing this every Sunday with my daughter, where she just sits there and watches, and she's like really into it. Um, I would like there to be a more of a um a refined way to do this and not, you know, do a raspberry Pi and do ROMs and right. stuff like That's that. I mean. Like, yeah, there's that. no reason the companies that own this stuff can't just make a $50. Listen, they're leaving thing. money on the table. They really are. It's, stupid. it's yeah. stupid that every one of these is not available. Um, talk about the fire TV. I, something I'm something <laughs> more of a predictions again. What, what was that? Are we varying away from predictions now? No, no, no. This is kind of a prediction for me. Uh, they kind yeah. of lost their flair this year, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, the second-gen Fire TV, and people don't know this, actually. The second-gen mm-hmm. Fire TV is the best Fire TV you could buy on the market today. Not the third, not the current. Okay. The, because, remember, there's no Fire TVs anymore. Just a stick. It's the yeah. Fire TV stick, the 1081, like the, the 4K okay. one, and the Cube. Yeah. The cube you would imagine would be their performance one. It's slower than the second gen Fire TV, hmm. which is interesting. I think they're going to yeah. get away from that, and they're going to put out another Fire TV that's high performance. Yeah, it's reasonable. That that's that's a prediction for me. Uh, I I 
I've, I'm a big Fire TV fan. That I have literally one in every room, except for the one that I have my Apple TV in that I hate. Um, <laughs> so that that was my prediction. That I, I I'm gonna see they're gonna have a gaming level Fire TV out there with, um, and they're gonna partner with major titles on launch. Right. So it kind of goes with the gaming thing. Well, mm-hmm. do you have a prediction? Uh, this is under the Apple heading, but uh, I, I, I was glad to see Apple focus on quality uh, with iOS 12. You know, this is the first time ever that older iPhones actually run better with the new OS. Apple always very specifically ignored that, ensuring that they would run slower and that you would want to upgrade. So that was a nice thing. But when they did that, what they also did was pushed aside a bunch of things they were working on that would have otherwise made it into this release. And I think that we're going to see those things in iOS 13 next year. Actually, knowing Apple, they'll call it iOS 14 because 13 is an unlucky number. But um, that's another prediction, by the way. Um, and I, I think key among them are going to be user experience improvements that iPhone users have been waiting for for years. For example, I just want to put an icon on the screen where I want it. I don't want the, every screen to have to start up on the top left corner and go across. And, you know, when you think about it, a lot of people want to use a phone one-handed as much as possible, but even if they don't, two-handed, yeah. your, your hand's at the bottom. And when the icons start up at the top left corner, it's literally the furthest distance from your finger that it can be on the screen. It, it creates a really awkward situation. Like if I um, show you my Android phone, like the way I organize my home screen is that I put the icons on the bottom. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah. Because I'm holding it, I can reach them, <laughs> you know? And then you can you can see the picture at the top, or whatever. I think we're going to see stuff like that. I think iOS Next, whatever they call it, is going to focus on um, some important and long overdue changes to the user experience. Yeah, uh, I agree with you on that one, actually. Uh, I got I got a good one for you. Uh, there's been a lot of, <laughs> the, the, over the past week, a lot of news coming over about Facebook and how they potentially were giving access to certain things that a lot of people wouldn't be happy uh, that they were giving access to to partners. What do you? I, I actually want to get your prediction on this. Do you think this is going to affect them in any way? Uh, them being Facebook? Yeah. <laughs> um I think Facebook is a little bit like Apple in that there has been a reckoning and um, they're going to emerge on the other side, kind of beaten down a little bit, slower growing, but still humongous and important. And I I struggle with Facebook personally because obviously they're terrible, but as obviously it's also the way that I keep up with a lot of the people that I know, Mm -hmm. whether they're friends or family, whatever. And, um, you know, I happened to just move recently, but even when I lived in Boston, I was only nearby a X number of friends and family, and I only saw X number of them kind of on a regular basis anyway. So Facebook has always been great. You know, when my cousin's child goes to kindergarten for the first day or some guy that used to work for Microsoft, but we're still friends and he's going on a trip or whatever it is, I, I still, there's a service they have to provide that's excellent, that's still very valuable. And um, they're going to have to change the way they do things uh, to stay in business. So, you know, we'll see. There's been a lot of high profile defections, but I don't think those mean anything. Um, I think the thing, what means something is real people, right? And you must see this on Facebook. You know, you, you people will randomly post something like, hey, just so you know, I'm kind of not posting as much on Facebook anymore. Uh, and they they yeah. may or may not say something like yeah. you can find me over on Instagram perhaps which is ironic because it's owned by Facebook or whatever but um, I think you know w- once people lose interest they get you know Facebook could disappear I don't think that's going to happen next year but they need to get it right and um, like Apple I think they have to make some big changes uh, I agree with you there I, a lot of noise you know I last week we were talking about uh, tech immaturity, you know, especially when it comes to social media. I think we will start seeing a change in 2019. People are getting a little bit more self-aware. Um, I had somebody message me that he was listening to the conversation we were having about the things that I'm, I don't want to get into now, but he, he mentioned that his employer, the last two employment uh, verifications that they've done 
they have really gone and looked at his social media because this is becoming a thing now. You know, people are somewhat responsible for things that they say digitally now in the real world where, uh, for instance, they found a forum post that he had made from, you know, six, seven years ago that yeah. really he was he was I don't know what it was, but he said he was very aggressive. It was like an aggressive post he had made towards somebody. And they questioned him on this post. He probably was 22, 23 years old when he did it. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, listen, uh, people make mistakes, whatever. But in a weird way, this is kind of reconditioning us to act like, you know, good people. So maybe maybe that'll that'll start changing this year. I'm trying to see what else I have for this year uh, before. Do you have a meeting at two, by the way? Yeah. OK. So we could. Uh, it's actually a it's not my usual meeting, but it's. Hmm. Yeah. OK. Um, I give me give me a couple more. Do you have any more? Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I don't know what this year is going to look like exactly for smartphones. Um, it's possible that sales are going to plateau or even drop and there's this kind of feeling that the, the, the smartphone market has reached peak smartphone or whatever. Um, I think that continues next year. I think we're going to see, I think the smartphone is going to go plus or minus 5% over the previous year for the foreseeable future. And so this puts the onus on companies like Samsung and Apple, especially, but on everyone really, right. To, kind of get it right this time around you know samsung and apple both released what i would charitably call minor revisions to existing products which you know is fine it's understandable it's you know what apple calls like an or what we apple people call an s year upgrade um but i think given the way the market's going they're going to have to figure out some big changes you know frankly so i it, next year could actually be really interesting for smartphones and this year, frankly, there was a lot of interest, a lot of excitement, right? Every time there was an announcement, it was a big deal. But honestly, most of these products are just like, eh, like whatever. And I think they really need to get over that. So interesting. Tech Leathercraft got... says, what about folding phones? Yeah, well, I, I, Samsung is going to announce one this year. Yeah, I don't think folding phones are going to be a big deal at first just because of the expense. And so they're going to be kind of niche uh, at first and... Um, Honestly, I don't think anyone's going to want to buy a first generation anything really, right? So it, that's something that will get more common over time. And uh, it obviously will get better over time. But I, you know, as an iPhone, uh, sorry, as an iPad mini fan, I really like the notion of being out in the world, being able to open up a phone and, and, and have it be a bigger screen that I can now watch movies on or read or whatever. Um, but I, I think we're talking two or three years down the road for me anyway. I mean, we'll see. Uh, let's see. I got some questions here. Uh, proper multi-window in iOS. Maybe, uh, maybe that's some, well, here's something, here's something that we know is going to happen. We're going to get the next version of Mac OS is going to have iOS integration. And, uh, I I'm curious to see how that path changes iOS and Mac OS in the long run. We're probably not going to see those changes yeah. really happen until 2020, but, uh, 2019 will be the start of that integration. Yeah, I mean, actually, that's another. This isn't a prediction. Another thing that will happen next year is iOS apps are coming to the Mac, right, in a big way. There's a lot of work that needs to be done there. I don't, um, I don't know if we've talked about this exactly. Like, I know you like the Apple News app, like I do as well, but there are some UX conventions there that are just kind of missing in action, and there are uh, things like keyboard controls, which you would expect that is not available in these mm -hmm. apps, and so that's a plat that that. As a plat, I don't know we call it a platform, but th that has to mature so that iOS developers can add those things to their apps and have them only be exposed on a Mac. And then we're going to see the the third party apps uh, appear probably this time next year or whatever. And it's that's gonna it's interesting. I don't don't get me wrong. I don't think this is what puts <laughs> um, the Mac over the top or anything. I mean, Mac sales have been going down too, but um, I think it's. It's going to be a big deal for Mac users well, for sure. You know, th this really, uh, this news app really reminds me of Flipboard and and when it first initially launched. I I absolutely loved Flipboard when it first came out, and they got bloated and they got yeah. a little crappy. But and yeah. I and I don't use it at all anymore. But yeah. this is really back to that where I could curate the news that I want and some stuff that I don't really read regularly. Like right now, this curated on its own, right? Uh, because I just launched it. Well, it, it's doing something. I mean, you know, you obviously, I, it's been a while since I've set it up, but I think the first time you use it, 
you kind of say, yeah, I'm interested in this stuff. And so I like the, I like Apple news. I <clears throat> I've gone back and forth between various news apps. Uh, but it is a curiously Apple centric news feed, right? It's like world news, travel news, iPhone news, you know, U S news, political news, Apple news, you know, like there's like an Apple thing in there, like every third one. I mean, it's a lot of Apple type stuff. So, uh, oh, yeah, I'm looking. Well, I have windows central right. on here and boy genius report. What does? Yeah. Curated, uh, I guess, based on my interest, it gave me, um, it's, a, I, I, I like it and I'm curious to see what they do, uh, beyond it. Uh, when you know more applications come anything else you want to add before we wrap it up no i actually really gotta roll okay. Sorry, just paul's roll gotta go uh this was a last year paul thank you for everything this year uh you're a very good friend you you were uh wow. instrumental on everything that <laughs> instrumental on my decision making <laughs> for me that. to leave my job so uh, thanks for that i love you paul all right guys uh we also love all of you for tuning in every week Guys, you can subscribe to us. If you're watching on YouTube right now, 64 people on there right now, hit the subscribe button. We have about 5,300 people that are subscribed. You can hit the subscribe button and subscribe to the show. It helps us out uh, unbelievably every time you guys subscribe. Also on iTunes, uh, everywhere podcasts are available. We're on Spotify now. So subscribe to us and it uh, you know keeps us going more and more. Also, fund us on Patreon, patreon.com slash what the tech. I'm going to be doing a, uh, a what the talk following this if you're watching live stay tuned you can continue watching us uh if you're listening to the podcast go to patreon.com slash what the tech and you could get access over there to uh our special shows and we're gonna be doing a lot more in 2019 uh it took a couple of months for me to get my you know life back in order uh and uh it's it seems to be doing really well now everything is kind of moving the way that it should uh let's see anything else going on uh amazon guys i know that you're doing a lot of holiday shopping and i know a lot of people are going to purchase stuff after the holidays if you go to gfq.co slash amazon and bookmark it you could use our amazon link and uh, we get a couple pennies on every sale that's made so that's also another thing that keeps us going i gotta buy some new cameras again so that is a huge help you can follow me on twitter at andrew zarin you can follow paul at the rot and we'll see you guys in 2019 see you later